Greetings everyone and welcome back to TNO The Last Days of Europe. I'm your host, Scottish Mocha Lover, and we're playing of course as the Republic of Scotland, but we have strange flights from the SAF. Lossie Mouth? Robert McIntyre. Had sat at his desk and rubbed his eyes. No less than five MPs had walked in that morning alone, each with newspapers from different sources, yet all had said the exact same thing. It appears that the flights from the SAF Lossie Mouth had recently undergone a change in how they planned their practice flights, as the papers reported that they were far more flights near, and in some cases, overseas centers. Robert McIntyre leaned back in his chair, or his black leather chair. He knew that the relationship between the military and the civilian government wasn't the friendliest right now, but surely they weren't planning bombing runs on Scottish cities. He went through his thoughts and drew off the conclusions that made any amount of sense. It could be that they could simply change their flight times. The SAF usually carried out practice missions during times of day when they wouldn't be as noticeable, but be it early morning, evening, even and even in nighttime. It could also be that they had decided it was time to switch up their flight routes, but and the men had gotten too used to routine and commanding officers had decided that they needed some shaking up. However, and that was a fulcrum on which this all balanced. However, of course, and it could be possible that the SAF was preparing for something. Preparing, not for a foreign threat, but a domestic one. And what's that's what worried Robert McIntyre. McIntyre. He needs to decide on a course of action before it's too late. And of course we have Scotland Forever, which is about to finish up. I know I already did read the Revitalize Economy, so if you'd like to read about this, go right ahead, but we're just going to go ahead and click on and have a good time with it. So we get some more political power, we get, you know, another factory. Ooh. Oh, Armed Forces Paranoia. Okay, cool. Infiltrate the exercises. Uh, let's see. Investigate the flights. Force officer resignations. That does not sound good for us. We have, of course, English minorities as well. So, infiltrate them, investigate. How about we investigate the flights? Start an inquiry. Let's see what that does. Because, like I've said before, I have not tried this off-screen at all, so... The first time you're seeing this is the first time I've seen this as well. And America being violent. <sighs> Just doing American things, policing other countries. Of course, they're in their sphere, I believe, so whatever. Couple comments we to get to, but the father of the nation. McIntyre puts on his best smile as the bulbs flash and covering falls. Before him, John McCormick is a polished and clean graphite stands almost imposingly at the steps of the University of Edinburgh. That they considered using marble. They considered using marble. But McIntyre thought it too ostentatious. He thought it was enough that the plaque bearing his name was also engraved with the father of the nation in an appellation that the man himself would have winced at. It's not a particularly accurate representation, but it's good enough. He thinks. He's lost his pouch in the transition and he can't even remember him with such a peaceful smile, but it'll do. Besides, they didn't even put the statue up for the man himself. They put it up for them to remind them of what they've been of where they've been and who'd taken them there. For that it was good enough. Nek temere nek timid. I suppose that's sc Scottish? Gaelic? I don't know. I don't know. All I know is that I want to save Dunehammer's grandparents in this timeline from the people of England, but like I said, comments. Let's see. So it recommends we try out the Unionist England as well as a Unionist Scotland. Well, I'm not opposed to that. We could try that sometime. Sure, I mean, Scotland has like three paths, if I remember, so we could try that, but Wimberley's armed forces. Field Marshal Wimberley's stance on national defense is well known. He believes that anything outside of Scotland's borders is likely to be a danger to its independence. In order to defend against these potential threats, Scotland's armed forces will need to be better equipped and rapidly modernized. Both of these targets will need to be met soon if our republic is to survive. While any future onslaught remains unlikely, it will be better to head Wimberley's advice and prepare for the worst. We will have to keep our lands, skies, and waters safe, or we will be very, very sorry. Now we've got plenty of political power. Not sure what I'm going to do with it, but hey, we've got a lot of political power. Next up one is, someone recommends, actually quite a few people recommend that we stay Liberal Democrat. Um, so I'm okay with that. I'm totally okay with okay liberal, dem liberal Democracy, basically. So we'll see how far we can get. I can't promise anything, but I can just try and say I'll do my best. So... And let's see, what, what's over here? Military, strange flights. But let's start an inquiry of the SAF, Lossy Mouth. The God Gate. Corporal Logan Baines looked up from the magazine he had been reading and leapt to his feet. There were no planned special arrivals, at least he had thought. He could see a large convoy of sedans and trucks approaching the gate. He grabbed his radio and spoke, uh, Command, this is Gate A. I got a large convoy inbound over. A convoy, hissed back the radio. Yes, sir. The, the lead car is pulling up now, but you might want to come down here. As the lead vehicle pulled up in front of the gatehouse, the window rolled down, revealing what was unmistakably two security, secret service Two Secret Service agents. Both of them flashed their badges and the driver began speaking. As convoy is with us, we are conducting an official investigation of SAF Lossy Mouth. Your commanding officer should be receiving a call now and you should get the clearance to let us through. Baines took a deep breath to steady himself. The situation had escalated rather quickly uh, rather quickly for his taste. A few moments later, as he prepared to speak, as Rita spoke, let him through, Corporal, came the voice of what was likely the captain of the guard. As he lifted the gate, he began counting. In the end, no less than 20 vehicles had made their way into the compound. As soon as each car stopped, like a rehearsed team of football players, suits made their ways out of the cars and with no, virtually no communication, split off into teams, one each equipped with a camera, and headed towards every building on site. 
After some time, Logan watched as teams came back together or came back to the trucks and began compiling everything they had brought. Boxes of files, film, and even what looked like be little black boxes. He even saw a few of the crew officers being led into the sedans, which was frankly bewildering. Within a few hours, the last truck left the compound, leaving the base and several onlookers in the dust. What were they looking for? Why, why are they here? Force, I don't want to do that, but... <sighs> Robert McIntyre sends SIS agents into... We gotta send SIS agents. Uh, I don't like what's going on down here. The inquiry shows nothing out of the ordinary. Gosh darn it, shouted Rob McIntyre to no one in particular. Halliday stood silently shaking his head after days of examination. The documents and interviews collected had shown that absolutely nothing had been out of the ordinary. The senior staff who had been placed on house arrest had read it on SAF lossy mouth. The subsequent interviews had all been for now. Now McIntyre was in a tough spot. Unlike a surveillance team, it's incredibly difficult to keep a formal investigation under wraps. The parliament would have to be given a report, the men would have to be released, and no doubt some would come demanding why or to know why they've been dragged from the positions for no good reasons, but useless documents would have to be stowed away. Robert, Robert McIntyre reached to pour a glass of scotch for himself and drank deeply. Halliday surprisingly also poured himself some, and although he didn't attack it as aggressively as Robert had. What's worse, Robert McIntyre thought to himself, is this is that this would definitely not make relations between the civilian government and the military any better. At best, they'll view the government as untrustworthy and hide, seek to hide more and more of the activities from them. At worst, they might decide that uh, Robert McIntyre and his staff were in the pocket of the Germans and start plotting ways to overthrow the proper government. In the end, there seemed to be no way out of this mess except to plow through it and do his best to handle the fallout. Halliday silently collected the report and left the room, leaving McIntyre alone with his thoughts. The situation is getting worse. We need to be more careful in the future. Well, crud. Has Burgundy finally done it? God help us all. So if things go poorly, I'll, I'll you know mess around with things and make sure that it goes okay-ish for us. Hopefully. Huh. <laughs> but how about another focus? We got his forces, of course. His Air Force, a Navy. Ooh, more cost. Better monthly poverty change. Industry. Smoke over the Highlands. Scottish is just not Edinburgh. That's true. Campaign will do all right. Wimbersley advice. Tranquil Heights. It's a bracing moment on the Highlands, and the wind snags around him. He prefers it like this, though. It's affirming, relaxing, in a sense. It breaks a break from the unending scheming of Edinburgh, and a rare one with that. McIntyre had to appreciate those small breaks. It was a rare day that the government went without some disaster or another, and so his holiday taking had to be carefully managed and extremely infrequent. He takes in a lunch full of chilly air and gazes over the hills. This kind of piece had to be treasured. It was such is in such short supply. He thinks about tomorrow and the day after and wonders whether or not his premiership will be remembered fondly, perhaps. As a matter of his control, however, he has to focus on the immediate problems and come up with immediate solutions. He has to secure and protect Scotland's future. If he's successful, then the rest will also slide into place. He'll enjoy a day or two here, but then he has to return. He has a duty to perform, a government to corral, and a future to defend. He wishes he'd brought a hanky for his runny nose, though. Ah, oh, yes. New arms? That's not bad. I kind of want more military factories. Ooh, the armed force will become more happy? Or daily political power gain. I don't like that Anglo problem. Well, Scotland never. Well, let's take a look first. Hold on. So they're paranoid. They're unhappy. So let's make them happy. Wimberley's advice. It's not a problem to admit that we have occasional differences of opinion with Wimberley. No, two people can agree on everything all the time. However, we can appreciate his commitment to Scotland being strong and able to assert its independence at the time where he gives sound advice. Our domestic arms industry is a core of our defense against a possible pact incursion. Funding it and providing aid will ensure that we have enough material to arm our men and can back them up with a steady stream of supplies. It's a good idea, and we should do it right away. I hope to God we don't get cooed. Um, let's see. So, someone recommends I actually do the coup, but the problem with that, as far as I remember, there's no focus tree for them, so that'd be kind of disappointing. But regardless, assessment of Scottish military readiness. The committee, composed of Admiral of the Fleet Edmund Anstis, Marshal of the Scottish Air Force Eric Brown, Field Marshal Bernard Lennox, and along with several other high-ranking officers, had finally reached an agreement as to how the Scottish military readiness assessment would be carried out. It had been agreed that each head would be responsible for the separate branches, and after some deliberation, each base, be it naval, air force, or army, was responsible for the assessment of its own forces. Officers from separate bases, but of the same branch, are to be the only ones, or the ones, who conduct the assessment as there is some concern if an officer was assessing his own men, that, would, that he would give them better or higher praise or rank them as more so ready than they really are. The reports will detail not only the readiness of individual groups, but also assess the bases themselves. This include a review of the warehouses, stockpiles of weaponry, as well as other necessary goods, such as rations, oil, and necessary mechanical equipment, as well as the overall readiness of the base. In the end, any stumbling blocks that are discovered will be reported, and as much as possible will be done to rectify any necessities, be it a larger budget, or the improvement of the equipment. The end goal of this report, and the committee's decisions, of course, is to be prepared as much as humanly possible for a war with a foreign power, be it a great power such as Germany, or a weaker power such as England. In either case, Scotland must be prepared to fight for her life. Hopefully, we will be ready. When the time comes a knocking. The true meaning of 
St. Andrew's Day. Pastor Renwick smiled sadly as the congregation funneled out. Every year was the same. More religious Scots attended church reluctantly for the Saint's Day, while the general population hardly remembered the day was attached to a saint at all. Whether they'd gone to church or not, they'd spend the afternoon and evening carousing carol sing at the festivals. Before independence, people had at least paid lip service to it as a religious holiday, but since the fall of the United Kingdom, St. Andrew's Day had become little more than a day of nationalist chest thumping, a day when the flag was more important than the religion the day was devoted to. Pastor asked a small voice from one of the pews. Ah, Miss Whitney, Ren Renwick said with a smile, his eyes resting on a child who'd stayed behind. Well, just wondering if you'd be at the, at the festival. Ma said you were praying and stoof last year, but we just really missed you there's all. The whole combination will be there, will be there you know... Uh, as not fair if you uh, to have to miss it. The whole combination, you say? Asked Renwick with a smile. Well, if you really want me there, I'll go, but we'll have to pray extra hard this Sunday to make upward, okay? St. Andrew would want us all together to celebrate. Robert McIntyre sends SIS agents to SAF Lossy Mouth. Jim Halliday stood in Robert McIntyre's office, listening intently to what he was explaining to them. Halliday, of course, had heard about the strange flight schedules that the personnel at Lossy Mouth had undertaken. As Minister of Security, it was his job to keep tabs on every major player in Scotland, be they foreign, like the English or domestic, like the military, that seemed to constantly jump bump heads with the state. He had considered creating some form of proposal to Robert McIntyre to allow him to send a few of his most trusted SIS agents to the base so that they could see if anything nefarious was being planned, but it seemed like Robert McIntyre had been ahead of him, although in a wrong direction. So what do you think, Jimmy? Should we go down in and arrest the officers to start an inquiry? These changes to practice missions are too close to our population centers to make me comfortable. Jimmy saw his chance. Frankly, sir, while I do think we need to do some form of investigation, going in guns blazing may not be right call. I recommend going in, uh, in Kakani. Let me put together a surveillance team, which could then collect some information for us just before we decide to take any action. After all, as you said, it could be just standard procedure, but also might be, God forbid, a part of something bigger. Robert McIntyre nodded. Jimmy sensed his response even before he spoke it. All right, Jimmy, I'm handing this operation over to you. Don't screw this up. If they find out we even tried to piece some surveillance on them, their response could shake the very foundations of this nation and lead to disastrous consequences. Jimmy nodded, and his face grave, his face grave as he turned around to leave the room. Even as he got into his car, his mind was churning with who might, who he might send. Not only who was capable, but who could be trusted. He hoped in the end that they wouldn't find anything. But, as with all things in the aisles nowadays, one can never gamble on a single, single outcome. Well, alright. So here's what we're going to do. Oh, that, oh, that takes 20 days. Ah, intrusion in Edinburgh. Effie McLeod got things done. When she was tasked with something to do, she did it quickly and efficiently without regard for what got in the way. People, plenty of people said this was the wrong way to do things, but that way of doing things put her far up in the chain of command to the point where she was now secretary to Field Marshal Wimberley. So, when she got a message that was marked urgent, she was going to deliver that message post haste. The problem was that she had no idea where Marshal Wimberley actually was. He had mentioned something about meeting yesterday and hadn't shown up today. It sounded important, but how important was it really? It was peacetime and it couldn't be as critical as a message she had to, had to deliver. One of the other secretaries had mentioned her boss having some sort of meeting in the basement. Perhaps that's where he was. It was worth checking it out, Effie thought, as she descended the staircase, this staircase to the long corridor in the basement. The meeting would be in a room that had been mostly used by the maintenance staff, but the military sometimes used it for secret conferences. As she approached, she heard muffled voices unintelligible. She heard a few vo words, but she couldn't assign much significance to them. She also heard a few of the voices. She Some seemed to have an accent that was a little more southern than the one she usually heard, but she didn't take any notice. What did get her notice was the voice of Marshal Wimbledon. Opening the door, she started, Marshal, it's from Washington, and noticed Wimberley and several other Scottish officers. Some she recognized, but she didn't recognize the others in attendance. Some were even in civilian clothes, a few had on berets with a red star, and one was even more assured of an officer in collaborationist England. And she noticed this map of Britain on the table, with markings all around England and the Scottish border region. And on the maps were the words like drop zones, safe houses, supply routes. But one unusual word stuck out. All over the map, all in capital, Himmler. They closed the door behind her. Oh boy! Screw it, we're going to force officer resignations. This is going to really piss people off. Because it takes 20 days to do... You know what? Mm, I don't want to do that. Oh, but we have to do that. Uh, maybe get some more events first. I don't know. Man, I just want to cut down the budget and defend Scotland. That's all I want to do, man. That's all I want to do. We don't have enough manpower for this. But I guess that's why we're trying to go with Wimberley's advice. Hurts their organization. Get slightly more recruitable population. Less recovery rate, less stability, war support, construction speed, factory output. All that good stuff. Ah, new arms. Oh, Agent Succeed. Cool. Uh, Agent Donald Atchison, Atchison was sitting in his truck as a lossy mouth gu gate guard checked his identification papers. They say that he was, rather, Len Findley, a fire inspector contracted by the airbase to ensure that the fire systems were up to date. Hot Command had decided that this was the best way to get him inside, an officer would be too conspicuous, as, and a standard maintenance man would unlikely be allowed in where he needed to go. He thought of the other agents on the task. One, Agent Gareth, 
who had already slipped in as a grease monkey and was likely already planting his microphones along with other bugs amongst the planes on the fields. Then there was agents Hastings and Bannerman, who were in the sewers attempting to attach bugs to the numerous phone lines heading out of the base. And this was a big one. If any of them were caught, this whole operation would go up in flames and all of Scotland would only suffer for it. The guard finally closed his identification papers, handed them back to Mr. Finley, and opened the gate to let him through. Once he'd found a parking spot reserved for on-site contractors, he grabbed his tools, his fire alarms, and smoothly made his way to the headquarters located towards east of the complex. Soon enough, he was inside the building and got to work. He worked quickly, mapping out the paths of officers and guards as they passed. As they finished up installing the alarm in one of the rooms across the, from the map room, an officer stepped out of the door and went on his merry way. Agent Atchison took the opportunity to enter the room, having seen that there was nobody else in the room. He quickly went to work, snapping photos of just about every document and map he could find with a small camera SIS had provided him with, whilst also dropping all manners of bugs everywhere he could, vents, holes, and the like. He finished up and departed towards the control tower. There were still plenty of rooms to go. New arms, though. Our recent improvements to Scotland's arms industry were welcomed. However, domestic military production is not where we want right now. Even our recent aid hasn't gotten as close to our goals. More important, more support is needed. An increase in funding will guarantee Scotland's arms industry, which will be able to achieve parity with the country to the south. It ensures that we will be able to produce not only guns and support equipment, but cannons, trucks, and aircraft as well. Our freedom depends on our men in uniform, and our men in uniform depend on a generous supply of weapons. We lose some political power, which is fine. We get a whole single military factory. Obviously not enough. Uh, I'm going to grab these guys immediately. Well, actually, we could... Mm, yeah, go ahead. Since these guys are Scottish Home Guard, they would have engineers' business as usual, though. Robert McIntyre breathed a sigh of relief as he listened to Jimmy on. Go or go on. Jimmy had been right, of course, as he wouldn't have become Minister of Security if it wasn't often if he wasn't often correct. His team had done their duty, gone into SAF Lossy Mouth, playing all manner of bugs all over the compound. Apparently they'd even figured out a way to tap the planes, and had discovered that thankfully the SAF was not up to anything. They had analyzed and reviewed hundreds of recordings and photographs, and with this final report Jimmy had brought to him, confirmed that the planes out of Lossy Mouth had simply made a change in their flight paths and times. There's no evidence of conspiracy to bomb either Scotland Scottish government or civilian buildings, according to Halliday, as as most, they were training in case of English or German brought the flight fight to them. Robert McIntyre gestured towards his desk. A drink, then, to toast a successful and peaceful ending to such a vital mission. A drink, not a holiday. The two men were made their way to Robert's desk and to the bottle of amber fluid sitting on it. They filled the glasses with maybe a splash more than was reasonable, but then again, Robert McIntyre felt that as if there was every moment to, in these dark times. Paranoid days to celebrate. This was it. At this time, the peril was not lost on either of them. A Scottish drink to celebrate a Scottish victory, so that means we should probably don't need to do this then, right? But the strange flights have not stopped. They're paranoid. Ooh. Do we investigate, investigate, investigate? Hmm. I do want to keep them happy, but... Oh, civilian budget boost. We gotta boost that up. Boost. Uh, I don't want to cut the people anymore. Are we still mobile? Uh, 25 days. Fallen. McIntyre is pleasantly surprised by the professionalism that he's seeing. It's only been a generation since Scotland had inherited a broken and defeated military. One scarred by defeat and confused as it to his own identity in a post-Union Britain. When really proud, he preens when he sees the well-regimented lines and barely hides a satisfied grin at the absolute discipline parade. A better trained bunch you shan't find on these islands, sir. Any foreign threat, either in Britain or from afar, will find themselves utterly outmatched. McIntyre is not only entirely taken in by the hyperbole, but as he watches a group of recruits nail drill after drill, he can't help but find some part of him agreeing with Wimberley. The man is certainly a zealot, one that has been wary since, of, wary of since the day he had met him, but he certainly achieved results. Dismissed. Oh. Okay, and do we have any more construction we can do here? I don't think there is. Oh, good. It's not much, but it'll do. Oh, wait, what do we have down here? Yeah, not much. Hmm. Do we force their resignations? Well, a strong border, which I will do, I'll make them more happy, which is good. Interviews with the SP Scotland never changes. English approval will decrease. The satire. A saltier will uh, fly forever. Could be nicer. Lesser requirements. Scotland has changed. Make promises. English approval increases. We will make promises with the English minority leaders about our commitment to the free England. That does, however, mean if Himmler are to fail at the English, the English will be angry, huh? Do we get any more happiness from the army here at all? Wimberley's army, always ready. Basic training this combat schooling, which would be very good for us to get. A wall of guns? Crud. Oh man, this is probably a bad idea. 
I do want to try to force officer resignations because they'd be unhappy. <sighs> hmm. Oh, happy 1963, everyone. Let's see. If they're unhappy, if we don't force them to do that, there's a coup still possible. You know what? I'm not going to do it. Screw it. I'm not going to do it. I'm not going to force them to resign. If we discover already what they're up to, then it should be okay. Right? Now, if they do coup us, well, I'll just go back and make sure that they don't actually succeed. Oh, new arms. Good. A strong order. Oh, a strong border. Every policymaker, officer, and soldier in Scotland knows where he will be attacked. It is along this vast south or land border with England to the south. We have known this for a long time, have dug defenses and installed fortifications, but we shall back it up with even more now. We will ensure the border is the most fortified area in Scotland, that it is a maze of barbed wire trenches and hidden pillboxes and bunkers. We will not leave any weak lines where the English may surprise us. Hadrian wants to build a wall to keep us out. We will show them what a real defensive barrier looks like. The Burn Supper. Some hay, meat, and can eat. And some wade eat that want it, but we hay meat and we can eat, and say the Lord be thank it. The Selkirk Grace. So begins Burns each day every day. After the host has given grace, a small chorus of soup is dished out for the hungry guests before the haggis is served after alongside Robert Burns address to haggis being recited with accompanying bagpipes. Most remember the somber Burns Day feast during the Second World War when the Japanese blockades and interferences led to spice shortages and bland cuisine on the famous poet's celebration. Most are too grateful for uh, the spice to return to worry over much that the nutmeg has a Japanese label rather than a Dutch one. You powers, what? Why make mankind your care and dish them out their bill of fare? Oh, I'm butchering this, aren't I? Oof. Well, Marshall Wimbley's remarks to the 501st. Not the 501st, but the 1st. 51st. Men, I want to tell you how proud I am of you. When I inspected you today, I saw that men were trained, men were, that were motivated, men ready to defend. But more than that, I see a division that is as organized and as proud as I've come to expect from the 51st Highlanders. When I was first assigned to this unit, it was a motley collection of Scottish troops thrown together from the reserves. The first iteration of the division was not much better, having been betrayed and abandoned in France and left in a German prison camp. But I knew we had basics to make the best unit in the British Army. We were going to train hard. We were killed wherever we could and only have Saxons and the unit only when absolutely necessary. And when the Huns came, they didn't face the reserve division they expected. They paid for it. Even at the end of the war, when the Nazis stood astride the aisles, we were, ones, we were the ones who made sure they did not advance any further. And we stood there ever since because we were the finest unit in the British Army and we were the finest in the Scottish one. When the crowds come in, you will have to do, you will have to do the job that we old folks have failed to do. And you, I know you have the spirit to meet this challenge. Three cheers for the ladies from heck. I hope I didn't make a mistake there. A little bit of lag. Oh boy. Hmm. Strange flights have oh, stopped. Okay. Nice. And let's go and grab some of. Well, they're going to have to stop, but let's start making some better guns. Are you sure of this? Robert, the Republic of Scotland asked Halliday. Oh, uh, okay. The local newspaper confirmed Jimmy Halliday's most recent intelligence. It appears as if the strange flight schedules and paths that the planes out of SAF Lossiemouth have been conducting had recently ceased. How they nodded? Yes, sir. The planes have resumed their practice missions per their old routines. They're back to conducting practice missions in the late evening and early morning now, and they avoid major city centers for the most part. Nothing out of the ordinary except for the last fact that they changed their plans suddenly once again. Robert McIntyre nodded. As he continued to discuss the situation with Halliday, they were left with two working theories. One, it could be that they had simply decided to test the waters, so to speak, and see if they needed further training on the new practice mission schedules. Having been satisfied, they went back to their old routines, as their old routines were more aligned with the defense of Scotland from a foreign invasion. The second conclusion, however, one much more dire, was that they had conducted enough mistakes or enough missions to collect data for some other purpose, and to avoid suspicion they had ceased the new flights. Either that, either way, the flights had stopped, and there's little chance for them to find out any more information as to what the deal was with the strange flights. Hopefully those fellows aren't up to anything. Oh crud. You got all that English folk down here. Strong border? Well, at least hopefully they're happy now. But Wimberley's army, let's go ahead and do the Anglo problem. UP will do alright. We can out aid Himmler. Hmm. Scotland has changed. Scotland never changes. Hmm. English approval will decrease. Well, whatever. Uh, Wimberley's army. Ever since the war, our army has at all times remained watchful of any dangers from across our southern border. Our brave men have waited, ready to ensure any fascist who dares cross a swift and death, timely death. And if there is ever outright war, it will be the army who ought to show our majority share of the burden. Is that to us improve them sufficiently to ensure that in the event of a war, they will be prepared to defend our nation? Happy January. All right, over here. Cut that down a little bit more. We're doing a little better. That's not bad. How are we building? Are we building okay? Probably going to build a lot more force. We need more divisions, but do we get any more manpower yet? I thought we're mobile. Well, I guess we weren't mobilizing anymore, huh? 
I guess technically I should not cut the military budget then anymore, so. Simru Gok wins the Welsh elections. A bright spot indeed. Well, all right then. Following the Scottish Rail. The former London, Midland, and Scottish Railway is responsible for the vast majority of Scotland's rail traffic. During the war, however, the company was hurt when the most of its assets were seized by the collaborators when it was captured by the Nazis. Now, it's called, now called Scottish Rail. The company is still, better, is still struggling without its lines south of the border. Maybe we can help. A subsidy program will aid the company tremendously. But this isn't just a slush fund that can divvy out to executives and stockholders. These funds will go to track expansion, line improvement, and modernization, and purchasing new engines and railway cars. This will help Scotland Rail out tremendously, and what's good for them is good for our transportation. Scottish Army Report from SMRA Committee slash NSNB Clyde. Okay, so subject to the state of the Scots Army. Pre Preface. This report is based on information obtained from the assessment of all currently operating SA bases and their supporting organizations or operations. The report will cover materials such as overall preparedness of the Army, preparedness of the individual divisions along with their constituents, the overall health and fitness of the individual soldier, the state of the readiness of the individual bases, including their supply lines, warehouses, supporting staff, etc., as well as the state of the defenses on which the Anglo-Scottish or Scottish Anglo border, including but not limited to supplies, modernization efforts, and overall defensibility. Conclusions: Our Army currently is arguably the most capable and ready for war of tomorrow branch. The men have been found to be in excellent condition, both physically, mentally, and in terms of discipline. During the assessment, they were found to be more experienced and capable than during, they were during World War II, and the time period immediately afterwards. Furthermore, they are still well stocked with ammo, rations, and other necessary items. They also boast well-planned logistics, be it timetables, supply routes, etc. Furthermore, the defenses on the border between Scotland and England are extensive, well-maintained, and continue to be reinforced as world tensions continue to rise. At this time, while we are confident in the readiness of the Scots Army, we still encourage an increase in the budget to account for recruitment, training, and better armaments. It is imperative that the SA be prepared to fight any war that comes to its doorstep. Scotland depends on the Scots Army. Any more research? Oh, yeah, five days. Prepare readout systems, arm reserve training, that would be really good. Less minimum training level, more recruitable population factor, 20 more organizations, nothing to laugh at, and plus 20% more defense. That is the absolute perfect thing that we could use. Inspector of the Military Academy, Academy Cadets. So what's your name, Cadet? Asked Wimberly. Patrick Donnelly, sir, said the young man from Lerick. Lerick? I thought most young men there chose for the Navy for a military career. Seasickness, sir. Must have been a heck of a trip, remarked the field marshal. He mo moved on before stopping in front of another cadet. You look familiar, he said. Was your father in the 51st? Yes, he was, sir, said the cadet. Captain Spencer McGregor of the 1st Battalion, Gordon Highlanders. I was hoping to take his, uh, take his assignment one day. If you're half as good as your old man, you won't have to worry about making captain, assured Wimberly. He then kept inspecting the line before stopping in front of another cadet. And what's your name, soldier? Mateo Beverbrook, field marshal. That's not really a Scottish name, isn't it? Are you a refugee? Not really, sir. My family lives in Doomfreeze as far back as we can trace it. Wormley smiled and kept up the inspection. These cadets would make fine officers, he could tell. And all of them would do what they must do to defend the nation of Scotland. But will they do the unthinkable? Well, at least the armed forces are now disgruntled. They're paranoid, but they're disgruntled, so... Slightly better than before. And English don't really care for us. Which, you know... Whatever. Industrial technology? Oh! Sounds like fun times, but let's go and do the intruder. German aircraft reaching Scottish airspace was an unusual occurrence, but that it was not unheard of, and it was something Flight Lieutenant Webster and his wingman were familiar with. Many times it was a German naval or strategic bomber looking to show Scotland who was in charge, and the challenge would be met by a Scottish Air Force. Webster was going to use the same procedure for the strange aircraft that was entering his country's airspace. As his flight pass passed the aircraft from the front, Webster could, could tell it wasn't a military aircraft, but a Junker 152 transport aircraft. He could clearly see the Lufthansa markings on the side of the fuselage as well. Commercial aircraft, he thought well, that was different. The flight he flew on both sides of the intruding aircraft, as Webster said into his radio, Hello, unidentified Junker 152, this is Scottish Air Force, you are entering Scottish airspace. I repeat, unidentified Junker 152, you are entering Scottish airspace. Please respond, over. The radio crackled, and a man with a German accent said in English, Hello, Scottish Air Force, this is Lufthansa Flight 302. We are requesting an emergency landing at Aberdeen, over. This is a new one. Most German flights didn't respond at all, much less asked to actually land in Scotland. Uh, Lufthansa 302, uh, Scottish airspace is restricted airspace. Please divert your course to... This is a mayday situation, the pilot interrupted. We have hijackers on board who will hurt us if we do not land in Aberdeen. This is a mayday situation. We must land in Aberdeen over. Now, that was really unusual. Stand by, said Webster as he relayed the information to Fighter Command. A few moments later, they gave him an answer. All right, Lufthansa 302, you can make a mayday landing at Aberdeen. Follow me, but if you deviate from the course, we will take aggressive action over. You will not have to worry about anything like that, Scottish Air Force, said a new mysterious voice with an English accent. Thanks for the escort. Over. Well, this just turned out to be an interesting development, but industrial technology. The highlands are, by simply simple geography, hostile to industry. There's little we can do to expand our industries across the islands. There's simply not enough room to build more of it. Our nation is small. To compensate, we must ensure that a few industries that we can support are at the cutting edge, which and that which we cannot produce in mass can produce in greater quantity. Retaking a 302 Lufthansa. Oh, you see the Nice. Out with a crash. Very good. We barely make any money. Woo! 
Smoke over the Highlands. Oh, I'll read this one. It was allowed to file on them first. As they were playing and running about, they stumbled over a group of well-dressed folks with maps, tools, measuring this and that. When they ran back and told their parents what they had seen, they were given platitudes and told to calm down. Strange men in strange suits were no real consequence here. The, the, then the trees started getting felled, and the sound of blasting echoing across the hill. Suddenly, it wasn't just a group of children looking over at strange men, but half the town going to watch the whole industry unfurling. When the dawn was pierced by a shrill whistle, the whole town rushed to sleep, laying there before them, tracks curling this way and that, and lurching forth on them, a metal beast spewing out smoke. They knew it was there, or they knew what it was. Some of them had family lowlands, never had they expected to see it in their own lands, though. Some of them watched it all, others in dismay. Either way, the town folks knew that whatever isolation they had, pastoral looted, had been shattered. The fingers of the industry had curled around the north. Now retaking of the plane. When the hijacked Junker 152 landed at Aberdeen, Scotland was expecting the worst. A group of local police were awaiting the aircraft on the tarmac, and a group of people, special police were on its way in case negotiations went sideways. However, the hijackers were more than cooperative, surrendering themselves at the first opportunity due to the Aberdeen police force. It was a huge relief to everyone concerned. The hijackers, a man and woman, explained what they were English, who hijacked the aircraft with a toy gun and started a pistol. The goal of this forced landing in Scotland was so that they could defect along with the women's 11-year-old daughter. The situation was not unheard of, and there were reports of these types of hijacking using the Union Pact with varying degrees of success. Since this method of escape, although dangerous, was not actually illegal, the English hijackers were allowed to stay in Scotland. A quick analysis of the 59 other passengers and seven crew revealed most were English, along with a few Norwegian boys and girls and uh, Germans. They were headed to Bergen with their, when their flight was taken over the North Sea. While they attempted to process everyone and get into contact with packed diplomats, informing them of the safety of the remaining passengers, officials went aboard announcing that anyone on the flight could, could still seek asylum in Scotland. Surprisingly, three Norwegians and four English accepted the offer and were taken to the main terminal. Once everything was cleared up, Lufthansa 302 was allowed to leave the airport and continued to Bergen. Laws prevented indefinite detention of the aircraft, and the passengers and crew had arrived in Scotland under duress. As the press took photos of the unusual aircraft flying in the evening sky, many of the people breathed a sigh, a lot, a sigh of relief and thought about the unusual occurrence. Just another day at the Aberdeen Airport. Very, very nice, and after the industrial technology, social security distractions. Poverty is a genuine concern for a large amount of our people. Those that are above it live with the fear that they could fall underneath it and with any slight economic upset. Even those that live comfortable and financial secure lives are all but one bad way, day away from ruin. The institution of social welfare schemes would help provide a safety net for those threatened by the breadline, as well as providing a government public good faith of other policies. More stability, more, way more cost, and slightly more poverty rate, or decrease, technically? Ah. Eh. It's still going up, but the cost. PLFGC takes over the Levant. Okay, well, blood, we nourish our land. Cool. 70 million? Well, we're doing the best we can here. Itchy trigger. Trigger? Trigger. You got more surrender limit and more defense on the core territory. Oof. English. Oh, if this is getting worse and worse and worse, that's not going to help us. The 63 Scottish Open? Cool. Four Yale Phil Rogers as a ball shot forward in the crowds who moved away as soon as they saw the shot. It was eight, hole 18 during the final round. He was eight strokes away from the winning against Bob Charles of Kiwi. The two men had recently tied with each other in the last round. Arnold Palmer had recently finished in the 26th after being a heavy favorite due to him winning the past two tournaments. As Phil Rogers walked to the ball, Bob Charles watched, hoping that he would win his first Scottish Open. As the crowd was quiet, Rogers hit the ball with a 9-iron, hoping to get it just a tad closer to the green. However, he had hit it a bit too hard and ended up landing in one of the many sand bunkers on St. Andrews. He walked over the Swillican Bridge to his ball, and once again, the crowd was silent. As he hit the ball once again, however, this time it did go far. Rogers bit his lip at this revelation, while Charles clapped with the rest of the crowd, watching him with much interest. After 20 more minutes passed, it was apparent that Rogers was going over to going to go over par. He double boogied in the end. Bob Charles smiled as it was announced that he would win. He walked down the Swillican Bridge with thunderous applause and shook his opponent's hand to, and, to receive the trophy. Charles wins by eight strokes. Cool. So we got that. That's good. Light aircraft. I don't even know if we have industry to even support aircraft at this point. Now we don't even have any aircraft. Well, that's going to be really bad for us then. Um, hmm. Anti-aircraft, that could be helpful. But let's grab that one. Whew. Well, after this, Scotland is not just Edinburgh. There's a reason why people say not to place all but one eggs into one basket. To sacrifice the futures of our rural populace for the sake of our capital would be a grave mistake. As much as we want Edinburgh to be an MB, we also invest and to develop the rural regions of Scotland. We're not a government for the elite, and we must never abandon those who have entrusted us to enrich their lives for the sakes of the pockets to so plutocrats and business owners. Cool. Anything else here? No? Okay. Our next research will be done when? Uh, about two months. Oh, there goes those guys. Boost. Um. Ooh, if we don't cut them anymore, I need that that manpower right now. So I'm not gonna cut it. We have 30 million 
For liquid reserves, Jesus. Ah, uh, that's not good enough. We're going as fast as we can in terms of production. Ah. Uh. Oddity at the Redford Barracks. The Redford Barracks in Edinburgh, one of the largest military facilities from the old UK, has been overstressed by the sheer scale of the military expansion of Scotland and our efforts to deter English and Germanic aggression. The cavalry barracks was quickly renovated in the aftermath of the Second World War and repurposed into a second infantry barracks. After this, two proved to be difficult or inadequate to haul the soldiers. A third was planned, but funds have been yet to be allocated to the project. At 6.19 p.m. today, the gates of the Redford Barracks opened and allowed a large procession of military vehicles or police vehicles to enter. Within the hour, perimeter patrol duties were handed off to the MPs and a number of additional sentries were deployed through the yard to watch over the soldiers as they performed their day-to-day -day duties. Across the road, a pair of civilian police officers watched the MP take over with concern. Upon returning to the precinct and delivering their report, it became clear that no one's quite certain what caused an MP takeover of one of the most consequential military sites in the country, but it certainly can't be good. Is the army hiding something? Oh crap, don't tell me I'm going to get cooed. Maybe we should investigate it then. Uh, Navy, new Scottish Army combined operations. The, yeah, the legacy of the British Army. The British Army was known for to be many things, but inexperience was never one of them. Decades, if not centuries, of gradual refinement made it one of the most effective fighting forces the world has ever seen until it was defeated later on. <laughs> yeah, this should not deter us from learning from the important lessons that it learnt. For this reason, we should follow the doctrine that it left behind. The 1963 Highland Games. Bagpipes filled the area. It was the Cowell Highlands Gathering, one of the more premier Highland Games in Scotland. As the opening ceremonies commenced, Marshal Wimberley was leading his 51st Highlanders through the opening ceremonies with him in the front. Behind him were the traditionally dressed soldiers in kilts with bagpipes playing. As the opening ceremony came to a close, Wimberley waved to the crowd and took a seat while the Highlanders marched off the field. The crowd was jovial. This event was one of the larger displays of Scottish independence and culture. There had been rumors of the event being postponed due to a thunderstorm, but it hadn't rained and the games had still occurred. The Caber toss had been the first event in the games. Some of the men who had been participating in the toss had been members of the Highlanders. The top through of the day... Uh, top throw of the day had been Evan Smart, one of Wimberley's Highlanders who landed the Caber perfectly at the 12... O'clock position each time we went. There was a small break before the next events. One of Wimberley's advisors asked if he was going to be a contestant in the hammer throw. Wimberley grinned and replied, saying he was too old for this, but he did say he would watch. As the day went on, more events came by. There were astounding displays of strength in the weight toss. Some of the contestants threw the weight over three and a half meters in the air. The crowd had seen many feats of strength, but the day was coming to a close. The day ended with a gathering of many Scottish bagpipes bands who had come to the festival, including the Highlanders. They ended with Scotland the Brave to a roaring crowd. A great, great celebration. Oh, crap. Reassign them? We will move the military police to a different location far from the capital. Crap. Send our men in. Invest just investigate them. I don't know. Just try that. Why not? So, are we getting the men we need here? Are we... We're slowly... Slightly mobilizing. God, our core population is 7 million people. God. Can't the Scots make more babies? Scotland, we need you to make a few more babies. Come on, Dune. <laughs> cool. Regardless, let's see. That'll be done in about a month. After this, always ready. Yeah, I want to change my army professionalism. The Scottish army is, frankly, of a relatively small size. And while it's made of a Scot born both Scottish nationals and Englishmen who fled the coming of the Great Tide, it still pales when compared to some of the great armies of Europe proper. We will continue to offer special benefits to the veterans who are willing to impart their experience to the new members of our army in order to ensure that should war come to Scotland, we will overwhelm them with the professionalism of our troops rather than the strength of our numbers. Let's hope so. Woo. Cut. Oh, we got, oh, we got a little bit of manpower, but police investigating police. Are we sure this is legal, sir? I'll spawn in the army, I mean, asked Officer Campbell. Chief Sealand rubbed his temples with the stress, leaning back in his old chair, which creaked horribly in the complaint. No, I'm not sure it's legal, but importantly, but it's important, and you're the only two that can do this. He said, looking out over his officers, Don Campbell and Gilroy Duffy. They were a mismatched pair, Campbell being a bright-eyed youth, while Duffy was an old and better vet who fought in both world wars and coming out of them fuming mad and with a chip on his shoulder the size of Gibraltar. Because we're the best soldiers you have, sir, asked Campbell. Chief Seelan, or Clullan, oh, it's Clullan, scouted the assertion and leaned forward again to take a sip of the scotch and enjoy the fierce burn it left in his throat. No, he said, because your daddy's a high officer and Duffy served under every gosh darn major the army's got. Between the two of you, you've got the context to look into this. You, you think you... You think they're going to do something, shouldn't they? Scott Dufry, that was terrible. I think uh, if the army thought there was something going on that was big enough to warrant them bringing in an army of MPs into a barracks within city limits, that was big enough that they ought to have let... Local law enforcement knows something's going on. The fact that they didn't, well, if the army's up to something, it's just better that we know now. Just don't get caught. Investigation discovers something? The bundles of letters were popped up upon Chief Clayland's desk, of course. As though, as though that made everything better. Do you know how many complaints I've gotten about the two of you? Rumbled the police chief to the two officers assigned to investigate the Redford Barracks. Campbell nursed a black eye while Duffy smiled through his split lips and bloody teeth. <laughs> 
The investigation had been eventful, and while he, doubt, he doubted he'd either truly know what the two of them got up to, at least they got away without the army knowing exactly what these two, two pests were doing as they ravaged and rampant, rampaged through the army contacts. Quit your greeting. We got what you ask. No thanks to Greeny here. It's every letter and document we could get the stingy Rupert's take half up, and a few we had to flinch, filch. It's nothing definitive, sir, but there's at least enough in those letters to show that the MPs are here because of something that's going to happen. Though we can't be sure of what, or if anything serious or harmful, said Officer Campbell, his stance rigid as he reported. I need more officers. I need you to give me something that I can act on. Get back out there and give me some bloody answers. Sir, there may be an issue holding the investigation back, started uh, Campbell, st staring daggers into Duffy. What followed was a ten-minute argument between the officers about which one of them was to blame for the rockiness of the investigation thus far. Enough excuses. Give me answers or give me your gosh darn badges. Well, do we... Do the next one, I guess, or... We could send our men in. Uh, oh, where one least suspects. Scotland has never really been considered an ethnically diverse area, nor at least for much of its history. Sure, there have been plenty of people from other areas of the British Isles, but not many of them from other areas. A East, few Eastern Europeans have recently settled here, though. The Nazi Empire is entirely reliant on slaves, and several relocated to England took advantage of the same opportunities afforded to other Angles. But there is a significant and surprising ethnic group that exists within the Scottish borders. Many believe in the world that Poland is a dead nation in culture and a statement which provides many with sadness and some source of glee. However, one needs only to take a bus route to Glasgow or Edinburgh to find themselves surrounded by red and white with signs and Polish scripts in Kielbasa, Piorgi, and Bigos advertised in the windows of the restaurants. And one, upon seeing this, would ask, probably ask why. The answer lies in Scotland, the Second World War, actually. Many people end the history of Poland on October 6, 1939, when the last Polish position at Cox surrendered. However, Poland was never really stopped fighting. Many soldiers had used neutral countries to traverse to England, and so did a sizable number of civilians. Many of them ended up retreating to Scotland, and there were still a few Polish units on the border when the war started, when the war ended. The Poles in Scotland aren't nearly significant or as large as an ethnic group as Anglos, numbering only the tens of thousands. However, they're still there, and just as proud as committed to keeping the new home free of German occupation. Some see the existence of their neighborhoods as a fluke of history, but many see it as proof that a proud people will find a way to survive and prosper in the face of determined genocidal opposition. Not quite yet lost. We're going to sign push them in. English property seems like it's going a little higher. <sighs> Not good. I don't want to do that yet. We have enough manpower now. I'm going to go and do this as well. It's good. I'm going to do this as well. i got to get at least 10 combat. What? That's minimum. We have the manpower for it, but the gun-wise, we've got enough for it. Cool. Always ready. A little bit of lag here and there. It's June 25th, of course. I clicked on something. Not sure what's going on, but whatever. A hail of shells. A new tank. Not bad. A wall of guns. Well, I think it's time for us to do the Anglo problem. A massive number of Anglos had arrived out of border from down south. They typically moved to one of the big cities and just stay there, taking all the low-skilled jobs and getting involved in various criminal activities. And most of them still think that it's, it's the UK, or that it should be. Ordinarily, we just send them right back to where they came from. But sending refugees fleeing fascist oppression back is unconscionable. So, so we should try being pragmatic for the time being. Who knows? We might find that fitting these square pegs in a round hole might be easier than we thought. Oh boy. Nice. So that's done. Let's grab some of this infrastructural reserve. And let's keep going with the guns. We gotta have the best guns. Nice. Military spending. We're still mobilizing. I'll cut the military spending once we get all the manpower back from that, so... <sighs> I don't want to make a decision here regarding this. But if we have to, we have to. Scotland never changes. <sighs> Scotland has changed. Lessen the requirements. Could be nicer. We want to be as independent as possible. We can be... I don't think there's a path for us to... If you like to read about this, go right ahead in terms of black market training. That's fine. People did recommend we do this, but... Mm, assert a position. English approval will decrease. Let loose the police. <laughs> yeah, I want us to be independent. <sighs> Adapt their behavior towards the English population. Lessen their requirements. Agree to disagree. Make promises. That a commitment to the free England does not... Does, however, mean if Himmler are to fail, the English will be pissed off. The best gifts, though. A million, that seemed quite like enough, but Wimberley, as he filled out the check, that was quite the sum, but he could, not, but he could afford it with his savings and pay. He'd be making his, this donation eventually, so he might as well do it now, and they needed these funds anyways. The receiver of these funds would be University of Dundee, a research university in the town of the same name. He had always had a sort of soft spot for the university, and he was not unsympathetic to the desire to be independent of the University of St. Andrews. He'd be trying to help them out from the behind the scenes, but there was only so much he could do in the current position. Adopting a more subtle tactic was a better way to make the change. By funding the university, he could expand and expand a university 
university can make a better case for being independent. Already, the plan was bearing results, and the university was gaining a greater degree of autonomy. There was talk about becoming an independent operation soon. One really briefly thought of what the money could be used for. The new engineering building, most likely. The civil and mechanical engineering departments were getting a new structure to hold classes and labs in. How this money would help them build and up the facility. However, the buildings would not bear his name, he was certain. In fact, outside of a few people in the leadership, no one knew where the donation had come from. That was just as well. The last thing school needed was a controversy, and how would the socialists in the dorms respond to the possibility of attending classes in Wimberley Hall? Maybe not right now, but perhaps after he'd gone out of the limelight, would Dundee decide to reveal this mysterious benefactor? Are the ones given in secret? Well, everyone, the government has mobilized, and as you can see, there's a lot of events on screen. But... The report about Redford Barracks passed from the Edinburgh police to the federal government kicked a hoardedness of paranoia among those in the know. Those politicians who had the knowledge of the crisis acted quickly, leveraging every loyal asset they had to try to get a grip on the situation. Unbeknownst to the public all, the barracks and the surrounding streets became a saturated mass of secret service agents, military informants, and loyalist officers, each trying to suss out the fine details of the situation. With such a hyper-concentration of intelligence agents, or assets, it was only a matter of time before the military secrets were laid bare, and yet a few nervous government aides began to wonder, with so many on the case, will the army sniff out the investigation first? We have a right to know what they're planning. Oh boy. And we don't even have enough political power to do this one. Reassign them. Ooh, that's not good. Oh, that's not good. But the future later. Affair, part one. General Derek Lang hurriedly rushed into the office and closed the door. We have a problem, sir, he said out of breath. Wimberly looked up from his paperwork. It wasn't like Lang to suddenly rush in. What's going on, he asked. I just got word from the first fusiliers, explained General Lang. One of their men have been missing for a few hours now. Ordinarily, there'd be no such reason to raise alarms in the HQ, but this is different. They've raised the possibility of the involvement of German intelligence. What evidence is there to make such a claim, Derek? Well, it makes sense, sir. The soldier was involved with communications. He has seen the defenses in the south of the country. He was close to the English border. You have to admit, sir, that's awfully tempting for the Abwehr. He could have run across the border with a few documents and some other interesting items. Now, we're really understood. Mother of God, where are we going to respond to this? How are we going to do this? I'm starting to have all the codes changed, for starters, but we're trying to see if anyone in his unit is also involved. But there's only so much we can do. We need to get the civil authorities on it so they can start tracking any angles outside of the military. Fair enough, Derek. You'll do, you do what you have to do, and I'll get to the Prime Minister on the phone immediately. A prompt response is vital to a case like this and Part 2. What's going on, sir? Asked General Lang, who had been... Re Requested to see his commander and immediately. Wormley was in a foul mood. Read this, he grumbled, handing the letter to Lang without looking at him. L Lang suddenly uttered the paper. And furthermore, your accusation of enemy involvement in this matter is without merit and entirely baseless. He paused and looked up, surprised. They're not going to investigate? They aren't, confirmed Wimbley, and it isn't much use appealing. I've already raised heck with the Prime Minister about it. You weren't the first person I called after receiving that. Crap, said Lang, and I thought they'd at least help us out on this. Bloody useless bureaucrats, Wimberley said. Well, we do have to contend with the fact that we haven't been able to dig up much dirt on the, uh, on the soldier of our own, sir. And is that because the government isn't helping us, or is it because that there's really nothing there? Lang couldn't answer. We'll try to go as far as we can, sir. Maybe something interesting could cause a re-evaluation re that comes up. And maybe we'll convince the dudes to actually look at it, Wimberley doubted. You can lead a horse to water, but you can't make him drink and a dash in the dark. Ah, here we go. James' heart was beating heavily as he was lying down on the ground. He could almost smell freedom. Uh, however, this would need to wait as some collaborator soldiers walked by the border who had been armed. James thought about what would happen if he didn't just see them. Would they have arrested him or just shot him right there? He was too panicked to think. It felt like hours for the guards to pass and they just paced back and forth on the road. Every time it looked like it was clear, the guards turned and walked down, back down the road again. Thoughts ran through his head. How much longer would this go on for? He began to panic. Maybe it was he, he was in the wrong spot. He pulled out a poorly drawn map and it was the right spot he had said to himself. Soon hours had passed since he arrived at the point. There had been some close calls, some rustlings from James lying down in the leaves and foliage that could alert the guards, however. They didn't hear him luckily. At the break of dawn, James couldn't take it anymore. When the guard's back had been turned, he made a mad dash for the wall. He threw his bag over the first and scrambled over the top. He landed with a thud on Scottish soil and ran over the hill. He surveyed the surrounding area, seeing the rolling fields and a small town in the distance. He then saw some Scottish troops looking at him. The one on the left was waving his hand and then ran over to James. He asked if James wanted to defect to Scotland. James simply nodded at peace, and hopefully he had found a home. Freedom at last. Well, we'll see what happens. Now, 15 days... And this is 20 days, so we're kind of screwed now for that. Or oh, 15 political power, 28 days. We don't have enough time to get that much political power, so. Oh, boy. So, Scotland never changes. Ooh. And the South Tier will, not, will fly forever. Back against the walls. Ooh. I really want to do this one, but you guys recommended that we do make promises. Hmm. I mean, Scotland is forever, but. Oh. 
I guess we'll try this one. If we do this path again for the SMP, I'll definitely choose the right path. So, throughout their years in power, we've held firm in our belief in a free and independent Scotland for the benefit of the Scottish. Yep. Yeah. We now find ourselves confronted by undeniable fact. Scotland is no longer composed of Scottish people. A large number of English have moved here since the war and were fully intent on staying here. As much as we want to believe that these English are all spies and saboteurs from down south, any decision based on fact has to recognize these people are worthy of our respect. The SMP shall thus change its policies to accommodate this minority and treat them as a citizen of Scotland as they, that they truly are. This sounds like this is wrong to do. <laughs> I can't even aid Himmler. Much ado about nothing. Agents infiltrating the Redford Barracks have managed to secure information as to the exact reasoning for the MP presence within the facility. Apparently, a popular old officer associated with the station troops was to be forced into retirement after in infidelities with his mistress were proving impossible to cover up. Fearing unrest among the outraged soldiers, Major Harbrook's military police were sent in the preparation for the announcement. Although all were involved were frustrated that as such a volatile situation erupted from something so mundane, they were at least glad that there's nothing to worry about. It would be nice if they let someone know next time they do something like this. Still paranoid, still disgruntled, so not bad. Hasn't changed, so we're pretty much at the same exact spot as before. And my goodness, I don't like our position. Oh, well, I could buy a lot of equipment. English minority. Well, hopefully with what we're doing here, that approval actually goes up. And we can use them as meat shields once the war breaks out. Hmm, I don't want to do that. Are we, are we done? We're done mobilizing. Ugh... Uh, do this. Oh, no, 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 no. Go and train again if you need to. Verona Conference ends, an interesting development from Italy. After that, we will do less than the requirements. Not everyone is Scottish, and not everybody can do become a Scottish person. That hasn't stopped us from trying. We've enforced strict requirements to promote the language and usage of the Scottish language, so we can bring it back. Unfortunately, many of the English refugees are complaining these classes are too hard and the requirements are too strict. Though reducing these requirements for Anglo seems a bit unfair, the benefit is that it removes a sore spot in the community. They aren't going to be good at it anyway, so why bother? And besides, it means may mean fewer English dropouts bumming around on the government's dole. Well, I mean, technically... You force them even harder than to learn it then. Or kick them out, but I guess in another situation we can't really do that, according to the government. So. An unsatisfying end. Oh. After hours of feverish cost-benefit weighing last night uh, from those in the know about the Red River situation, a decision has now been made. Although there's a significant cause to worry that the armed forces might have less than honest intentions with their MP allocation, it's also true that addressing the situation directly might lead to paranoia and discontent within the army. If they aren't planning anything nefarious and we crack down on them, we can expect that the next time like this happens, we will have something to worry about. Although the decision lets no one breathe easily, we will close the books on the investigation. The MPs, of course, are blissfully unaware of the controversy they've caused and they continue their blissful marching around the perimeter where they will stay. We will allow the Redford's MP to fulfill the purpose, whatever that may be. May God save us if we are wrong. We may never know the real reason behind all this. It feels like we're making a mistake, I'll be honest. It really feels like we're making a small mistake here. Ooh. What's our gun's cash like? It's not bad. I w really want 20 combat with, but we do need more soldiers, because I have seen, like, the English will invade, like, Kappa, uh, Scapa Flow. Scapa Flow, yeah. And while our military looks not too bad, it's still not perfect. We could be nicer. We haven't really seen eye to eye with the English. It's in our blood. We've certainly had our disagreements. We've been treating them as an existential threat to the nation of Scotland since the beginning. Maybe we should cut back a bit, cut back on that a bit. It's time to realize that most English in Scotland accept that Scotland isn't going to be joining England anytime soon. We should thus cut back, cut back a bit on the political suppression of them, and not have our police officers go after them as much. But still, go after them at least a little bit. So approval is not going up any. So what's the point of doing this then? Scottish language. Uh, grading changes. In accordance with the new legislation regarding standardized school, secondary school graduation, Oliva Academy has made an update to its requirements for underclassmen to graduate. This change concerns students who are English refugee in Scotland. Eris. Or heiress. The student qualifies as an heiress if they have a familial heritage from the geographic regions of England, Wales, Cornwall, or the Irish counties of Ancaban, Andun, Antoim, Ardmichaca, Dwyer, uh, Donegal, Monaghan, or Tyrone. The student also has either I been born in the above areas and registered as a refugee upon entry to Scotland, two as a current parent or guardian has been born in the geographic regions and registered as a refugee upon entry to Scotland, three has been registered as a displaced person in Scotland between 1943 and 47, four has a current parent or guardian who has been registered as a displaced person in Scotland between 43 and 44, 47. 
Aero students have been recognized to have greater difficulties than other students. One of the most notable is with the Scottish language. Many Aero students haven't had the same level of schooling in the Scottish language that regular students have had, especially those who don't have to take, who have not taken classes in Scottish primary school. A lack of cultural connection is also a large impediment to learning the Scottish language as well. Starting this year, instead of higher standards for Scottish language classes that are applied to the most students, Aero students will have the Scottish language requirements lowered to a standard grading scale. This is done to account for the lack of opportunity to practice their, their language skills outside the classroom. English are getting a little bit off a little bit easily. Hmm. They're getting off too easy, man. And they don't even change? Okay, that's not fair. They should change at least a little bit. Oh, we got two done. Nice. Go immediately with even more defense and soft attack. Hmm. Get some more land attack as well. We could be nicer and agree to disagree. The SMP stands for Proud and Free Scotland. The Anglos do not. We wish to work with England while being respected as an independent power. The Anglos wish to override us and subject us to the control of England. We certainly have our differences, but that's no reason why we can't be nice to them. We just need to be mindful of our different opinions and goals, and focus on keeping them close enough that they can't make a move without us finding out. Hmm. I'm just worried about guns, and at least we're making more divisions. That's good. Uh, what else do we have here? Do we have enough support equipment? We do have enough for now. Now, let's go ahead and do this one. Good. And I can't support Himmler right now, which really sucks, but we'll see what happens. Uh, let's see. Disgruntled. Black market stuff, provide training. Scottish infantry. I'll probably provide training because we can't really afford too much else. Better trucks are nice. Let's agree to disagree. But don't we have something here done? Oh, we already did. Okay. Oh, wait. Invest in it. Invest more. The boys in blue. One more thing, lads. Super chief, superintendent or chief superintendent of the Glasgow Police Division, Lachlan Byron. The government has called off the English Neighborhood Surveillance Program. Just got word down from on high. The man groaned. Why did they do that? Asked one officer. They thought that just watching English neighborhoods waiting for someone to commit war crime, war crime or commit crime wasn't going to do us any favors, the superintendent explained. So it was costing us goodwill just watching these neighborhoods like the Gestapo. So now, before we get up surveillance in those areas, you got to get a warrant and explain to them or what you think is going on there. Then you set up shop. I know it's a big change, but they're thinking that by not reminding them of the old country so much, they'll be more eager to actually call the cops when they actually hear someone being beaten to death outside their homes. Several officers started to get up, seeing the superintendent was wrapping up his remarks. Oh, and if you don't mind referring to them as Sassanok dudes so much, that would go a long way as well. As would less bonking their heads on the patrol car roofs. Hear that, dude? Stop bonking English people. I'm just joking. But I know nothing about Scotland or that much. I really don't know much about him. Except St. Andrew a little bit. So, make promises. It's no secret that we like a government down south that's a bit more friendly to us than the Nazis. Preferably one that has similar governmental interests or systems to our own. Of course, we are actually working towards that goal, but it might be a bit of an issue if we let everyone know that. The best we can do is emphasize our, emphasize our desire to see that the collaborators in England remove for power. That will help the English minority see us in a positive light. If a free England doesn't happen, though, we're kind of screwed. Back to school. These are the duties that Robert McIntyre actually enjoyed performing. A chance to see young children fresh faced and not yet embittered, looking naively and instantly at the world. A chance to see the real effects of the education reforms he pushed for so heavily. He greeted at the gate by a rosy cheeked woman in her fifties and quickly pulled into the classroom. The children, no more than ten, are being incredibly well behaved, he thinks, even though he spies a pair at the back with pursed lips and barely concealed sneakers or snickers. He asks if they're all enjoying their day off day to a course of yes sirs. He impressed when one particularly intrepid boy at the front quickly volunteers that what they've been learning. History in the Battle of Bannockburg Bannockburn. He smiles at he smiles at that. Good proper Scottish education. Uh, I mean, uh, the rest of the visit goes just as smoothly, and when he leaves, he can't help but feel somewhat proud. The English may have stolen centuries of Scottish identity, but with each new generation, they are reclaiming it. A brighter Scottish future. Uh, so if we're doing this, I'm going to go ahead and lose all the manpower for now, because I want to cut it. I'm cutting it. I got to. It hurts our output a little bit, but okay, that doesn't help us with our budget. God dang, I thought that would help us with our budget. I thought it would help us with our budget. My goodness, I am speaking very quickly. Woof! All right, then. Do we have any more things here that could go poorly for us? Probably. Uh, let's go with the Wall of Guns. Hitler's dead. Oh, boy. Here we go. The Edinburgh Summit. I think everyone here doesn't doubt this, said one English leader who has attended this conference. We know Scotland isn't going to be part of the UK under your party's control, and we've accepted that. We haven't taken you for idiots, said the head of the government officials at the government officials at the conference, and the UK at this stage is not acceptable to either of us. That's because of the regime down below. Agreed. Therefore, in order to provide for the safety and stability of these isles, the removal and replacement of the collaboration regime in England is a top priority. This government is committed to seeing that happen, and we will work with you to accomplish this goal. The fascist regime must be limited by all means possible. On that, we are in complete agreement. All right, then, let's get to work on liberating the country from the bloody Huns. A united front for once. And we actually have an extra division. Wow, look at that. At the same time, we can provide some training. 
Uh, well, uh, the Civil War is probably going to spawn actually very, very, very soon, actually, just because of what's happening down there. There you go. Cool. Well, Mr. Hitler dead. Uh, well, things aren't looking too good. Hold on, before we go too far. Never mind, it's lagging. Oh boy. Oh, did they already break up? They might have already broken up. It's October 24th, 1963, so. Oh, they haven't broken up yet. Okay. Uh, did you, the French state does not have a focus. Group. I just wanted to see they did. And what is Italy doing for the troops under Siano? Uh, regardless, we're going to go ahead and do the wall of guns. Up oh, a little bit more lag. Quite a bit of lag. I wonder if we can send volunteers. That might be interesting. Oh, yeah, that, it's, it's definitely spawning. There we go. A German Civil War. Goodbye, guys. So it begins. Our standard issue, which personally makes up the majority of our small armaments, has become antiquated and obsolete. The rest of the guns that we use are were likely used against the Germans back in the 40s. A new modern rifle will have to be designed to replace them. The addition of such a weapon will dramatically improve the fighting capacity of our troops and force any future invader to second-guess their aggression. A shadow loom over France? And over Europe, really. Chaos and awesome? There we go. That much more money is going to help us out. Oh, God. Wow. Germany, you've certainly made a mess of things. The Frank's frontier can no longer hold. Kingdom of England is going to be falling apart. It would actually be kind of nice if we could invade uh, both England and its Civil War counterpart whenever the war breaks out, but English Civil War. England! Oh, crap. German Civil War. Well, we'll talk about the German Civil War first, then. Hitler's dad has already his infamous inner circles dis disrespect him. The late Führer's pick of his successor has proven to be a fast fort flip with all the containers heading off from Germania with the basis of support. They bided their time, the first tracks have been dealt. Germany, the dominator of Europe, has collapsed into civil war. Bomb and goring, spare and hatred, it's all out war. Fighting for their own little squabbles of belief, they dragged in a whole continent with them. Europe is expected to be hit hard with the loss of their shoots have. The war itself, and most likely ex expected dire outcomes for Europe. Let us sigh a little thing of relief. For most of them, Douglas will release armed forces that reign into months of content with the constant threat of Germany looming in their minds dissolving for the first time. As Germany's th threads tear apart, the government and the armed forces get time to reconsider and consolidate. For one thing is clear, Germany returns and for all the luck we might have had, it could have been that Hitler proves to be a relaxed fear in hindsight. When the disintegration has been reversed, they might want to take revenge on everyone and everything, but there's also the twinkling star of hope. The dawn of a new age? Great. English Civil War now. England's always had trouble hit periods in its history. The most troublesome of all were those ensuing the, at, in the time after the Second World War. A kingdom with Edward VIII, once advocated and despised, was established. In its short existence, it can already boast near a dozen troubled prime ministers and tenures. At the latest, Alec Douglas' home promises to bring stability after an interregnum. With the overlord collapsing, however, the town was seized by the hawk circling their realm, the Cornish garrison. Thus, the next German five tune collapsed into uncertainty of a fraternal war barring the, the garrison. And resistance around this cloud, Alkenleck, that's only taking hold of a favorable movement and actively fights the collaborators. Much of the populace favors Himmler as they want to liberate England from the Nazis. It might also please Douglas Wimbley to know that the Germans pushed a step back. Uh, some worry, however, whether a free England pursues the restoration of the UK, which they like us to join. A new democracy in the Isles? Oh god, that's disgusting. Oh, we, oh, we can do that too, but English Civil War. Dreadful news has started to appear from the south of the border. England has become embroiled in a bloody and bitter civil war. Such violence so close to home is deeply unsettling. Whatever the result of this horrific war may be, it is unlikely that Scotland will emerge unscathed. As the situation continues to rapidly deteriorate, we will have to intervene to prevent the victory of the English collaborators, who possess a much greater threat to Scottish independence. The resistance movement, known as Himmler, will need our help if they are to prevail. England has never been in a weaker state, and it is essential that we do not let this opportunity go to waste. How paranoid are we now? Mildly paranoid. Nazi Empire continues to disgruntle. The English Civil War begins. Oh, right, let's take a look. The Kingdom of England, so authoritarian Democrats versus. Auchinleck, authoritarian democracy. Left resistance, huh? Hidden heroes, very cool. If you'd like to read about that, go right ahead. Something in the lock. Oh boy. Uh oh. It's not good. Andrew and Harry had been sitting on their little boat in the middle of Loch Ness. Unlike most of the other local kids, they preferred to spend their time fishing in the loch instead of playing footy on the pitch by the high school. The water had been relatively calm, spare for a few ripples on the occasional fish or eel. Both had grown up hearing story of the Loch Ness Monster, affectionately known as Nessie to the inhabitants of the many towns in the surrounding areas of the loch. Henry had been lying on the boat with his line in the water with his feet dangling over the edge when he had suddenly gotten a bite. He yelped and began reeling it in towards the boat. Unlike most of the other fish they caught, such a carp and pickerel, this thing had seemed to be pulling up more of a fight. Andrew stood up to the wobbly craft, attempting to get a better look. 
Mate, what do you think it is? yelled Andrew to Henry, who had been battling with a lime. The rod locked as looked as if it would snap at any second as a bobber raced down the glassy lock. Don't know, and it definitely ain't no pick girl, replied Henry, who had seemed to be pulling all of his weight on the line. The line then snapped, and Henry fell backwards, nearly throwing the two boys into the drink with whatever they had attacked the line. Henry was helped up by Andrew, who asked him a question, panning in the process. You don't think it was... Oh, boy. Serbs rise up. The Germany chaos, they might have a chance. English Civil War time. Actually, now we are at... <clears throat> Slightly paranoid. Good. Oh, crap. Uh, aid the Queen's resistance. Guns to Himmler. Well, I guess we'll do wall of guns again, because we don't got enough guns right now. How many are we out? Oh, my goodness. Uh, well, these Scottish Home Guards, do we even need motorized? Not really. South African War, end of the Rex Commissar at Novigan. Domino shall stop. Do these guys need motorized? How many. Uh, what divisions do we have? Oh, we have seven divisions, actually. These guys are the 12th combat width. Uh, how many motorized things do we have? 105, god dang it. Wimberley's second address, his address to the armed forces. Soldiers, sailors, and airmen of the Scottish military. Recent events have shocked the world and dramatically altered the situation on the island of Britain. We see for ourselves inherent weaknesses in fascism and desire for freedom over those that is kept under its boot. However, many may find the situation an opportunity to put up their feet and relax. Do not be fooled. The enemy is still strong and very powerful. He will attempt to do anything at his disposal to win by any method available to him. He has not forgotten his desire for world conquest and his plans for the free peoples that live in it. There still may come a time when Scotland is made to fight for its freedom like the peoples of England, Germany, and Poles, and the Baltics. We must remain ever ready and ever vigilant, ready to defend our country. We shall stand on guard against against any incursion to the butchers of Europe may take. And we will take the heart of that the men of the free world are marching besides us towards victory. Good luck, and may God protect you. Well, they are understandably jumpy. By, by training? Uh, that is fine with me with a little bit more training. That's fine. And you guys... Wow, all we did was get a minus point three. Are you kidding me? Is that it? The armed forces are now indifferent, which is good. We did make promises, and they still don't like us every month. I mean, what, what's the point then? There's no point in doing that then. Um, after that, we can do... Oh, my goodness, a coup. Strange occurrences at Aberdeen Airport. Uh, oh, crap, there's so much. Robert McIntyre listened to the briefing and spoke. Essentially, what you're saying is that you have no idea what's going on at the airport. The officer quite visibly swallowed. Commander Campbell noticed before replying with, In a word, sir, yes. All we know is that the army's gathering there. When a few local airport officers tried to question them, they were essentially either shouted away or simply ignored. One officer tried to force his way past the perimeter guard, but was driven away when a few of the officers brandished their firearms at him. Robert McIntyre nodded, then turned to Campbell. Jimmy, we need to know what's going on down there. What options are available to us? Campbell turned to the officer and dismissed him before replying. We have two options, began as Robert McIntyre made his way to the chair and took a seat. We can send a small team of men from the security service with the intention of implementing some surveillance, equipment, microphones, cameras, and the like. The other option, one with a little less finesse, but one that might be worth the extra degree of officiality, would have the Aberdeen Police conduct an official investigation. Either way, there's a chance that something is legitimate, and there's a chance that something is illegitimate. Those are our options, and we need to decide before it's too late. And it's vital we get to the bottom of this, and soon. Wolf's Dilemma. Mr. Wolf, sir. Wolf turns, shocked at the aide that's burst into his meeting. There's been reports of gunfire south of the border, sir, and we're hearing the same across England. They've taken up arms against the collaborators, sir. He can't quite believe his ears. He adjourns the meeting quickly, and the ministers filing out and muttering to each other. The next few hours are utter chaos. Emergency meetings, intelligence dossiers, drafting troop movements. Parts of him believe that this is not their fight, that Scotland has spent too long chained to England. To wade in now would be to entangle themselves in another war that isn't Scotland's. The other side of him sounds eerily like the unionist ministers have been listening to all day. Abandoning the resistance is supporting the fascists, they say. To ignore the suffering of the innocent is to aid in their oppression, he thinks. Someone is still talking, but is not really paying attention. He sits up straighter and steals himself. He has a duty not just to Scotland, but the victims of fascism. But at the end of the day, the first shipments of arms will be prepared to be sent to the resistance. He simply hopes that he's helping and not dragging his nation into another bloody war. Let us hope they remember this. Alright. Set up surveillance. Investigate him. We don't have enough political power for this, so... Surveillance, investigate. We're going to do an inve investigation, I guess. My bad. Alright, 64. That's almost there, but let's not do that one yet. Let's grab some more anti tank and piercing. We're going to need that against English armor. And what can we do with this stuff? Actually, can we buy infantry equipment with the black market stuff? Um, no. We had something here, but it's gone now. A wall of guns. 
and the Queen's resistance. While England carries on descending into carnage, it is up to us to support the people who share ideals of freedom and democracy. Those who have been loyal to the exiled pr Princess Elizabeth have always fought for such beliefs. Offering their assistance to them will greatly aid them in their fight against the tyrannical collaborators. It is most important that we give the Himmler as much support as we can offer, for the alternative will likely not be so friendly. Never mind. If that's the case, go and get rid of that, maybe. Do we have enough guns now? No. No, we don't. God dang it. I don't want to do this, but there you go. There we go. Now we can do it again. Special delivery. Provide equipment. Wait, where's that? Oh, it's down here? Yeah, no thanks. So this one is Himmler's England. They look like they're doing pretty darn well. Look at that. This London is completely surrounded. Nice. Oh, welcome to here. Purchase equipment. Purchase support equipment. Huh. Yeah, I hate to be in London right now. Never been though. All right, get the Aberdeen police involved. Robert entire picked up his phone and dialed for Jimmy Campbell. The phone rang up only once before it was picked up. Jimmy Campbell? Jimmy, it's Robert McIntyre. Galloglass. Gallo Glass. There was a pause before Campbell replied with Kern. What can I do for you, Robert McIntyre? I have an idea, Robert McIntyre replied. What if instead of risking any agents in the clandestine operation, and one for that if the agents were exposed could lead to some nasty outcomes for the agents involved and quite a possibility for us, we got the local police force involved in a formal investigation of sorts. There was silence on the other line for a few seconds. Robert McIntyre could almost hear the gears turning in Campbell's head. That is certainly an option. It would also make it more blatant that if the army is hiding something, it's one thing to deal with civilians sneaking in and another to deal with an official police investigation. They would have to comply or else show themselves to be up to something dastardly. Robert McIntyre smiled. Then we're getting them. We best get moving. I'll contact the police chief and invite him over for a brief meeting while you get the required permissions and materials for them to be able to pull this off. Make sure you get something together that can guide them as to what exactly you're looking for. This could be our ticket. Right away, sir. The line clicked. At times, a hammer is more than necessary than a simple scalpel. Let's see. Send Scottish advisors? Oh, we could probably do that. Our associates with the Free England may still lose to the collaborators, which is indeed a sorry thought, but it is one that we ought to keep in mind. Scotland's already shown her support for the Himmler, and if they're to be defeated, or if they're to be defeated, it will not be long before they likely become a target. Therefore, it makes sense for us to put down our own independence first and make defending Scotland's borders our priority, though we also hope that the violence will not cross the border. Good. Special delivery. Robbie McMillan was happy to see a small camp in the middle of the Kaelder Forest. It had been a long day, leading the convoy trucks from Jedburgh into the muddy and shell-filled English countryside. After hours of off-roading and avoiding enemy patrols, seeing friendly forces was a relief. At least it was, until someone shined a light into his face and shouted, Out of the lorries! Robbie hopped out with his hands above his head, holding his Scottish driver's license. Easy, he yelled back. We're from the Scottish government. There's... Get down, yelled a guard as he shoved Robbie into the mud. More soldiers were swarming the convoy. For a moment, Robbie thought the operation had been blown, but then realized for sure these men were Himmler. The guard picked up the license and studied it. What the heck are you doing down here? Delivering infantry equipment, Robbie said. Scotland decided to send you a boatload of guns. They said it was pre-ranged with you. He's not lying, said a rebel who was inspecting the back of Robbie's truck. There's a bunch of rifles back there. The guard relaxed a little. All right, you can drop these up, but no funny business. All right, all right, well, okay then, Robbie said as he got out of the mud. You have a towel? Well, at least they're understandably jumpy. Well, good for you guys. All right, so we can set up surveillance. I kind of want to. The army is doing its job. Campbell looked through the reports that had come in that day. His agents were deployed in essentially every significant group of individuals in Scotland, be they the army or political parties. He was searching for a report, but not by his own men, but by the Aberdeen police. Found you, he thought to himself, as he pushed a thick folder filled with information on that night's military activity, and picked up the little blue folder. It was relatively simple and fairly thin. Good, he thought once again. That means there's not much to report. He plopped himself down in his leather chair and began pursuing, gathering what he could report to Robert McIntyre. After looking through the document, he decided that he could summarize a ten-page report in about a single sentence. The army wasn't up to no good. The movements in the airport had everyone on the edge for a while, and now, while it was at first it seemed like it was something under the table, the police investigation, good call, he thought, had gotten to the bottom of the matter and reported that everything was up on the up and up. Apparently, from the moment the official investigative committee arrived at the airport, the military had more than just accommodated the officers. They'd been allowed to conduct interviews with random soldiers, pilots, and officers. There was apparently even at luncheon where they had discussed the situation over a local meal. In the end, the officers reported that even if one were to look away at one look at the military the way they conducted themselves at attempting to purchase good faith, in the end, they were innocent. Attached were also official military communiques and paperwork that had been handed over to the officers. Satisfied, Campbell picked up his phone and rang Robert McIntyre's desk. It was a good day to serve Scotland. I kind of want to set surveillance anyways. So, overt, it's covert. Oh, well, crap, they won. Hmm. 
Mm hmm. Should I get involved or not? For 20 days. Strange things is not active. So, I said they're not up to no good, so we're okay, right? Right? The Algerian War? Right? So, I'm going to I'm going to let it slide this time. By our own designs, by American Jets. Wow. Himmler victorious. This they auto just bypass everything. Wow. And Air Force, of course, uh, by American Jets, which would be nice. Our own designs would be nice. But I guess we'll do victorious at last. The guns eventually started to fall silent over England and out of the carnage or allies from Ember of Triumph. No longer will the people of England have to suffer under the tyranny of those who betrayed their own country. Peace and freedom are expected to return to our island once again. Very many sacrifices to achieve this, but at least we can now finally stop worrying about an invasion and return to the business of improving independent Scotland. Wow. Our greatest defeat. Oh boy, that would be really bad for us. Collaborator victory. So what does that mean for us? Maybe I should save up more political power too. How much are we getting every day? Point one eight. That's so much. Well, let's do one more focus before we call it an episode too. Let's go do that one. That's fine. Okay, I want to see what happens after this because it's because it basically finished the entire tree here. So do we get cooed? Happy 1964. I know this video has gone a little longer than usual, but the zoo and the, uh, the borders. The Scottish borders were well known to be a source of supply for Himmler forces, and the train offered protection for many guerrilla organizations. Thus, it was important for the collaborationists to pacify it. The offensive in one area of the region forced the rebels to retreat and gather in an area where they would make a stand ar around crossing the Scottish border. Day and night, artillery pounded the position, and machine gun fire permeated the air. But still, outnumbered and outgunned, the rebels refused to give up. This caused, caught the attention of the Scottish soldiers on the other side of the fence who drug trenches and watched the soldiers on the other side. Media began to gather on the Scottish side as well to record the situation. The fighting got worse and worse occasionally. Him, the rebels would hand off wounded comrades to Scottish troops to receive emergency medical treatment unavailable in their own stronghold. But these handoffs grew more and more common. Shells started landing closer to the border, setting fires in buildings near the border. A few landed on the other side of the fence, causing those in Scotland to take cover. Finally, the Scottish commander in charge of the border station had enough. He went over to the Himmler headquarters and told them to stop fighting. There was no way they could break out, and it was almost a certainty that they would be overrun eventually. They would be allowed to retreat in Scotland, and it would be certainly well treated. Nobody would blame them, and they performed to the best of their ability in the face of insurmountable odds. The rebels politely, politely refused the offer. They were diverting enemy forces, they said. They still had the means to resist, and they needed to only hold on for a little more time before the collapse collapsed. The commander returned to the border, understanding the sentiments, but amazed that a position cut off surrounded, and without hope, would continue to resist in spite of all logic. Let us hope that the comrades in the south may provide them deliverance. Well, they already won. And are they, who are they led by? Macmillan or something? Oh, no, Auchinleck. Auchinleck. Well, alright. Well, we let this go by. Even though we help them out, we send guns. They still don't like us every month. I mean, I'm not understanding the English. English are a very strange folk, I guess. Hey, at least we got one of these done. Level 4. They'll be done in 67. Or will be done in 64 this year. Himmler victory. Field British Field Marshal Cloud Auchinleck has never stopped fighting after the English surrender of the Second World War. He instead formed Her Majesty's most loyal resistance in the process of preparing the liberation of England since the yoke was pressed upon it. Months ago, it all accumulated in a great uprising to throw off Nazis after the proud fatherland collapsed on itself. The Republican flag rises in London as the last remnants of their garrison and collaborators surrender. The resistance's leading figures proclaim the liberation of England. Soon we might see the next democracy rise in the islands next to ours. This is a delightful thought and happened to be at the right time. The islands are free to the Nazis for now. Our armed forces' intensification of the borders is slowly retreating back to a normal state. The journals are easing down, in which turn gives the government again time to slacken. Nobody's entirely pleased, however, as it's still uncertain what the free England's future actions will involve. There are words about Auchinleck's new Republican government and tense about the restoration of the UK. We will not be lured into a, an, an uneven union. We have to worry about such things as Scotland itself is our foremost priority and not a union with England. We'll see how this plays out. Oh, what do we got over here? Now we have enough political power to do this, sort of paranoid. And we shall finish this with a free, victorious England. With the fires of the Civil War slowly turning to cold cinders, the English resistance stands victorious against the collaboration regime. This is both a great relief and a potential opportunity for the Republic, and we should immediately start working hard. Not only will we be able to ent entertain normal diplomatic relationships with our former brothers in the South without the risk of invasion, but with enough effort, we'll be able to rekindle trade and companionship between our two nations, which will help us greatly in these troubled times. But regardless, hope you enjoyed this Scottish video. If you did, please consider leaving a like. 
subscribe if you're new. Check out my Discord link in the description below, and I'll see you tomorrow when, who knows, maybe you still get cooed in the end. Thanks for watching. Have a great rest of your day.